need to get straight to my guest here, and uh, we're definitely going to change gears because I have the one and only James Corbett from CorbettReport.com with me, and, you know, it's always great to get James on the show. I did not know that he was recently going to be on an episode of Black Op Radio, but uh urge you to check that out as well <laughs> because that's an interesting discussion. I know it's going to go a little different here tonight. Uh, absolutely no plan in my mind with James, but I love picking his brain because this guy produces some of the most amazing stuff uh, when it comes to documentaries, when it comes to just the reports themselves at CorbettReport.com, when it comes to New World Next Week. I mean, it's just endless. Uh, the, 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 this guy, if, if you don't know who James Corbett is, do, do yourself a favor. Pause what you're listening to right now. Yeah, my show, pause it. Go over to CorbettReport.com and just... Witness the amount of work that has been done over there. Absolutely happy to have you with me, James. How are you tonight? I am doing excellent. The better question is, how is my daughter doing? The answer is not so well. She's sick, but recovering. So I am staying home today, uh, looking after my sick little daughter. So it's a small possibility, but a possibility nonetheless she will make her international radio debut at some point during our conversation today. <laughs> well, you know, that is okay. I'll be more than happy to hear from her. Uh, who knows? Maybe my, my son will bust in here, too. He's been in a strange place. <laughs> Uh, he's, he's just turned five, actually. Mm. So, you know, you, you never know. <laughs> the kids could talk to each three. other. <laughs> um, but James, uh, you know, yeah, there, there is the home life thing that is happening. Uh, you know, your view on a lot of stuff is, uh, is, is often very interesting. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Um, quite honestly. And I've had people say to me, you know, like James has changed over time and yes he has because he continues to learn and to evolve uh you know the James Corbett I was listening to 10 years ago and yes I've been listening to you for more than 10 years don't you feel old even though you're younger than me um mm. is is a little different than the James Corbett of today that's for sure um and well I I dare say the world itself has changed quite a bit mm. <laughs> in the past yeah. decade if you so. were to remain exactly the same uh, what was that joke I think Colbert did that joke at uh when he was arresting Bush at the presidential dinner or whatever correspondence dinner where he said uh He's the kind of guy who's who's really constant. He believes the same thing he did uh, on Wednesday that he did on Monday, no matter what happened on Tuesday, which I think is a good a good joke. Yeah, if you don't change your views and opinions over time based on changing events and your different information, then there's probably something wrong with you. Right. Hey, listen, you know, because you are in Japan, um, I, I've got to ask, because you must at some point take in some of the local media, and you must get some news that is probably not seen here in the States or, you know, in the English speaking world, quite honestly. Um, I, I, I got to ask some questions about a few recent events over there and, uh, and, and see what, what you gleaned from the, uh, national news coverage for you, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, you know the whole situation where you had a, a Japanese tanker that was allegedly attacked by an Iranian and all this other good stuff that they pushed down our throats for a couple of weeks until the panic was over, um, you know, and and tried to amp up the whole Iran needs to be dealt with because they are the global sponsor of terrorism, yada, 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 uh, in American media. Um, what did that look like from Japan? <laughs> Just to get out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, well, it looked, I think substantially similar in the broad strokes because even in the u.s mainstream press i did note that they were reporting on the owner of that uh, tanker saying no it was a flying projectile of some sort it wasn't a mine and mm. and things along those lines so that was being reported even in the u.s mainstream media um although that tended to be downplayed and of course the comments of the uh, u.s state department were generally given more prominence in that coverage here, I think perhaps the other way around. The story tended to lead um, with Kokuka Sangyo President Yutaka Katada, who said, I don't know why our ships were attacked. I'm angry the lives and safety of the crew were threatened and who made clear that it was some sort of flying projectile that did it. So I think that, that the sort of obvious angle here is that it was Japanese, and this is what the Japanese owner of this Japanese tanker was saying, and more, more, perhaps more important and more to the point than what the U.S. State Department is claiming, except, of course, what the U.S. State Department claims tends to become an on-the-ground reality in the form of uh, 
tanks or planes or missiles of some sort. So that's that's the I think the angle through through which that was being covered here in Japan. Right. But there's also the aspect of uh, who was meeting with uh, Abe at the time and what that reality signals as far as how smart this would be. See, I contended from the moment that this was initially reported and they showed us those grainy black and white images of, uh, you know, hey, look, here's the Revolutionary Guard over there taking something off of the side of the ship. Um, when, when they did that, I looked at it and I said, you know, strategically, I find this untenable for the Iranians to do this. Uh, other people argued with me that, you know, this may indeed be a pushback, a, uh, a, a way of showing, uh, look, you can't necessarily just, uh, do what you want to us and this and that. But my, my problem is that, again, this is a Japanese, Asset, which I don't even, I'm, what, what flag was it actually under? Uh, cause you know, uh, any vessel which is upon the water, uh, has a flag on it, right? It has a point of origin that it is ascribed to, uh, by the country. And I don't think this was an American asset in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's right. The issue of what flag it was sailing under, I'm not, I'm not actually sure about that. I didn't hear anything about that in any of the coverage. The only thing I ever heard about it is that it's a Japanese tanker from right. a Jap- Japan operated Kokuka Courageous, Kokuka Sangyo. So I, I don't know it, what flag it was sailing under. But at any rate, it certainly was Japanese owned and that was the only part that was ever stressed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the time, the timing of the attacks is the strangest part about it because there are even people like Moon of Alabama and other blogs that tend to have fairly serious coverage of these things were suggesting that, hey, it might have been Iran because they have done things like this in the past and uh, they they do have an interest in disrupting uh, flow of traffic in the area and what have you, blah, blah, blah. So it's it, we shouldn't rule it out. I'm willing to go along with that. But this, yeah, as you point out, the strangest part about it is the target is a Japanese tanker. At the very time that the Japanese prime minister was in Iran, uh, the first and only Japanese prime minister that has ever made a state visit to the um, Islamic Republic. Right. And that's, that's that's a bit strange. That doesn't make any sense from any tactical perspective whatsoever, other than to, and I suppose, other than crazy elements within the Iran Revolutionary Guard or whatever, trying to undermine any, any talk of t- calming down tensions. I guess there are those crazies that existed probably in every state. But other than that, there's it's really mind-boggling why someone would attack the the vessel of a for a visiting foreign prime minister while they are visiting is again it's designed to, whoever did it let's put it this way whoever did it it was absolutely designed to ramp up tensions and to cause disruption at a time when perhaps there was at least an opening for some sort of talks that might de-escalate the situation the obvious obvious um uh, intention of that was to escalate the situation Right. And, and at the same time, what, what is the end result here? Well, we didn't have the massive military action, although there was first a thousand and then fifteen hundred troops reportedly sent to the region, uh, in order to deal with the escalation. We have that situation that occurred there and the announcement said, you know, hey, if you do something, we'll obliterate you coming off of the Twitter handle of the, uh, POTUS here and all that good stuff. But, uh, but I did have to also note the, uh, the moon of Alabama blog spot thing because, uh, it was, it was just brought to my attention when I was questioning it on air. And it was like, well, these guys think that it may be legitimate. I, I just, I didn't come down on it one way or another. I just find the entire circumstance rather suspect. And I think that whoever engineered it had, uh, many intentions in mind and possibly it was a failure on their part to achieve an objective. I don't know whose objective it was. It just seems to me as though you might do something like this in order to uh, create more circumstances than were actually created at the end of the day. Exactly and, right. And, and let's put it this way. Extremists and warmongers on either side, U.S. or Iranians, who want to see t- tensions ramped up mm-hmm. can use events like these and can stage events like these in order to create that. And right. and if, from one perspective, it doesn't even matter which side is doing it because they are both playing into it. And the, these types of events do nothing but strengthen the extremists on both sides. I mean, someone like Ahmadinejad was an extremist in Iran who gained power and, and, and currency in the Iranian political Uh, situation because Bush, because of the neocons, because of the threats that were going on a decade ago against Iran. So they had a hardliner in power to speak tough against Bush in the the U.S. Well, this is the exact same type of 
situation where these incidents will foster more extremist elements within Iran. Um, and that that has to be part of the political calculus that's going on here. Mm. And I promise you, I won't ask you another question about Japan after this one, because <laughs> um, th- this is the other concern I have in my mind. This, uh, you know, recent meeting between Trump and Kim Jong Un at the DMZ, uh, I, I was I, I really was was watching my email to see what it was you might have to say about this. Considering that, again, um, the physical jeopardy that could be had locally <laughs> is palatable for somebody who's got to live on the island nation of Japan. Uh, you know, and, and I thought to myself, well, James must have something to say about this. I really didn't take note of any major article or anything from you about it. I'm sure you had to mention it and, uh, talk about, you know, what the, uh, diplomatic circumstance may or may not be at the moment, uh, because there were many meetings between Kim Jong Un and other nations, which also went, uh, previous to this meeting at the DMZ, which is, you know, a historic thing and all that, uh, given that we still have the Korean War not being fully officially ended, uh, it's 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 a weird circumstance. And uh, so I wonder if I could just kind of get a, a mini take on that from you right now, if, if you have one. Well, my take essentially is I'll have something of importance to say when something of importance actually happens to change the situation. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you, but did you hear anything from that DMZ meeting that actually was substantive in any sense that changed anything that's going on? I mean, essentially yeah. what I have to say about it is exactly what I said about it when this was all playing out last year and the year before that. And I've written many articles on it in the past, but I, I just don't see these, oh, it's a dramatic meeting at the DMZ. I don't think that's fundamentally changed the game or that anything different is happening. Obviously, there is still a North Korean threat of some sort. But uh, again, to what extent is that being used as a political pawn by the major powers, uh, specifically the U.S. and China, uh, in a type of chess game, a proxy war chess game? And that's that's the same situation that's existed for the last – well, the last few years at the very least. So see, I, I just don't see anything that's changed. Yeah, right. No, I agree with you. But that plus photo ops is really the only change. All right. And, yeah. you know, there, there, there's a bit of a PR game going on here. Hey, I've, I've taken care of it. Don't worry. Well, maybe I haven't taken care of it, but we've almost taken care of it. And don't worry about it. There won't be a nuclear threat. But meanwhile, uh, when they have decided to test some of these missiles, they have fired them in the direction of Japan before, Mm -hmm. you know, that's why I mentioned that, you know, in in a real world sense, if anything was happening here, uh, it might be of concern to you personally, you know, of uh, course. Yeah. And, and I did uh, talk about that back when those tests were occurring and uh, some of the, uh, well, I mean, fear porn in one sense that was being spread by the Japanese government here um, to trying to teach children and families, you know, oh, when you hear the air raids, I'm going to go and hide under your desk because that's going to protect you from the nuclear yeah, blast. Duck and cover. I mean, they, they are literally doing the duck and cover kind of stuff, or were at that time anyway. Um, but again, I mean, it is an ongoing situation, and I don't think anything has fundamentally changed or shifted. And yes, it is clearly, uh, to the extent that there is any sort of real military threat here, it would be directed presumably at Japan as one of the main targets because of the incredible incredibly large U.S. military presence here and the fact that Japan is essentially a U.S. military outpost in the Asia Pacific. And that, of course, puts Japan right in the middle of this. But interestingly, Abe and uh, the Japanese have very, very little sway in this whatever process is going on right now between the U.S. and North Korea. Mm. Yeah, no, that's the way I read the situation, too. I just was thinking maybe, (laughs) you know, there might be something a little different that you're seeing over there. But no, okay, you you and I are seeing the same thing, uh, regardless of how the propagandists want to propagandize. uh, We are we are observing the same thing. Um, So with that in mind and propaganda and all of that already uh, preloaded here. Um, let's talk a little bit about media and, uh, the manipulation of public opinion and stuff like that, because it seems to me as though, again, tracking your work at CorbettReport.com, uh, this has come to the forefront of your thought process once again, uh, regarding exactly what the significance is of the various narratives that are employed by different media and indeed other agencies, uh, in order to, uh, create certain atmospheres 
barriers to create certain public sentimentality. Uh, it, it does seem as though this is one of the core things that, even though it's not necessarily always announced uh, in your articles and in your uh, video presentations and stuff as of late, I would say it, it, it seems to be at the forefront of your thoughts. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, t- tell me a little bit about that. In terms of media manipulation of public sentiment? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is constantly at the forefront of my thoughts because that is essentially what I'm examining. Uh, One way or another, almost everything I do is something to do with the way public perception is being framed and managed and directed down certain routes. Because at the end of the day, this is an information war. It is about how to control people's perception of reality in order to better control the public. Because as the rulers of today know and as they have reason to know, having studied thousands of years of uh, human cattle management that would-be rulers have been attempting to impose on populations for millennia, uh, th- it is essentially, uh, you can physically control and enslave people, but that's a very rudimentary way of doing it, and that will always foster and encourage people to rise up against the evil tyrants. The best way to do it is to get people enslaved in their minds so that they do not even realize that they're enslaved, and the only way to do that is through concerted ongoing propaganda messaging and constructs that basically run people's entire lives. Mm -hmm. And that's actually exactly why I started uh, about a year ago. I started a a weekly video series called Propaganda Watch. Um, People can just type that into my search bar and they can find uh, going on something like 50 videos now that I've done (laughs) over the past year on all sorts of different propaganda constructs and ideas and examining propaganda from different perspectives. Um, The idea of propaganda and how it's used to manipulate public opinion, the idea of the potential for positive propaganda. Um, can can we use propaganda for good? Can can we uh, perpetuate truth through propaganda? Uh, propaganda in the media. Um, I'm just about to release a video uh, about propaganda, internal government propaganda, the types of internal um, propaganda videos that the government puts out for essentially for its own agents for training purposes right. that subtly direct their thinking processes. And one example that I'm pointing to in this is uh, one that perhaps some of your audience is familiar with, Operation Dark Winter, which was a uh, war game that was played out at Andrews Air Force Base back in, I think it was July, June or July of 2001, which was about a bioterror attack on the United States, uh, specifically a smallpox attack, although anthrax was used as part of that ongoing uh, unfolding scenario that they played out over the course of that two days played out with people like um, James Woolsey, um, who I believe at the time was the head of the CIA, uh, Judy Miller of the New York Times. Uh, these people were participating in the drill, and also uh, they produced these video news segments, basically uh, introducing new elements of the, of the ongoing scenario to the participants in the drill. Oh, here's a news broadcast about the latest regarding this unfolding small box em- epidemic, and it's produced to look and feel like a real news broadcast. Mm. And so I examine that and the way that, for example, that type of programming can be used to uh, influence the the actual government agents who then go four months later to experience those very events played out in the anthrax attacks of October 2001. And of course, one of the points of the June-July 2001 dark winter events was that uh, we have reason to believe that this uh, this attack was or this smallpox was spread with technology uh, f- uh, supplied by Iraq. I mean, that was that was, uh, two uh, two terrorists in Afghanistan. That was the actual scenario. So they are already f- three months before 9/11, four months before the anthrax attacks. They're already planting the seed that Iraq is giving biological terror weapons to terrorists in Afghanistan that the U.S. is going to have to retaliate about. I mean, that if that isn't an idea, a, a sense of how this can play out against government agents, I don't know what is. Well, the the real uh, interesting prospect here is that there are tons of these things constantly going on where, I mean, I don't know how to describe them other than they're sort of like live action video games of sorts, uh, where there, there are these drills and they are in all sorts of governmental agencies. Now, some people might say, look, the military has to drill. On these kind of things, uh, they, they must be prepared and, okay, <clears throat> I get your apology for that, but, uh, but, but here's the thing, every single one of these agencies that, uh, that does this is not necessarily all military. Um, there are various agencies that participate in these things, uh, like the Secret Service, uh, you know, and they have for decades. 
This is yes. not a new yes. and phenomenon. And thank you for bringing that up because that is an important point to stress. Sometimes this, I think, is taken overboard. And every time there's any sort of event, the people will go and dig up, oh, there was a drill or there was some sort of related kind of drill that was taking place sometime in the near uh, temporal vicinity of this event kind of thing. And I think that can be overplayed because, uh, as you know, reality check, if you go and check the, the drill and scenario schedule for some, for FEMA, for example, for the month of whatever, July 2019, you're going to find dozens and dozens of things taking place all across the country every day. There are many, 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 many drills. Right. Some of them will just by happenstance seem to line up. And I don't want to say every single time we find one, there you go, there, that's the explanation for the event. Of course not. But I think, I mean, first of all, with regards to dark winter, I think the, the precision of that scenario playing out four months before that particular scenario played out, specifically directed at uh, U.S. government officials, not it was it was a war game, but it involved, as I say, CIA, it involved New York Times reporter, it involved a lot of people from different government agencies and the corporate world right. and was indoctrinating them at that time. So I think that is significant. But as people who watch my 9-11 war games uh, documentary know, uh, corporateport.com slash 9-11 war games, I believe, uh, you will see that there were not just one or two or three or four drills that just kind of happened to sort of match up with 9-11. There were literally dozens of different drills and exercises that were taking place in and on and around 9-11, specifically dealing with those types of events that definitely did have something to do with the events that were taking place and and uh, the lack of air defense that we saw that day. That That is, I, uh, I think, pretty clear cut when you actually take a look at that. So there are definitely times when drills are significant, and there are times when I think it probably is coincidental. Well, right, and it is difficult to sort it out because, again, public awareness of this is not necessarily forthcoming. Uh, in in some scenarios, I, I know that, that things have gone on in certain towns where people who live there, you know, the average citizen was not aware that was actually part of the drill, right, is that uh, they would have to deal with people that were not aware of the circumstance. Uh, they do this kind of thing in, in places like Arizona and um, and Oklahoma quite often, actually. Uh, there are certain hot spots for it. And, uh, yes, indeed, there are interesting drills that do have a temporal correlation to uh, to 9-11 specifically that are just so on the nose. It's almost impossible to imagine that they're not somehow connected. But uh, but there's a lot of stuff that's vaguely connected or loosely connected or so on and so forth that, uh, you know, quite frankly, I think people's awareness that there is a constant indoctrination within the cultures of various governmental organizations organizations, uh, not just the military, by the way. Uh, again, I, I keep making that statement because a lot of people think of it as military stuff, and that's what you do. You indoctrinate them, and you, you know, drill them full of stuff. That's how you make soldiers. Uh, okay, I, I'm not going to argue with you there. I'm just going to say that... Um, you know the the uh, the Department of Agriculture participates in these drills. You understand? I mean, not you, James. I know you understand. I, I'm saying that it, it, there are agencies here that you might not think are military related or adjunct or connected or you know. Okay, FEMA has to deal with different disasters, so maybe they will stage simulations of disasters. And no, I'm saying that there are organizations here that really I, it almost seems unrelatable, but they constantly do this. So that there is a culture developed. Now, what does that culture do? It resonates one way or another, uh, no matter whether they embed, you know, New York Times reporters or they just use the guys from the local paper. Um, the fact is that these things will get carried out, even if they're told, look, don't discuss it with the public or whatever. Uh, we, we know that this, this indoctrination actually has sort of a, uh, well, an almost communicable disease effect. <laughs> Once it's uh, loosed on a, on a on a mass of people, they carry it home with them. They carry it to their other associates, their friends, their neighbors, so on and so forth. Uh, in in other ways, this is like a covert distribution of uh, of these attitudes and ideas and so on and so forth. What what do you think of that as a concept? 
I think that's very true. Again, I think this is part of indoctrinating the people who are going to be the front line responding to this in positions of authority and, of course, everyone that they interact with and they affect who say, oh, no, I know we've been planning for this for a long time. I know, you know, this is why it passes the smell test or that kind of thing. So there is that knock on effect. But even if we were to take this from the normiest of normie perspectives, I think we should ask ourselves why Bush, for example, felt compelled to lie uh, and, and, and brazenly so about, oh, no one could have imagined taking jets and slamming them into buildings. That, why, why would he even bother to insert that lie unless it was to convince the public that that indeed did not take place when we now know from numerous declassified our, uh, documents that that was not just planned and drilled once or twice, but was drilled over and over and over and over again in the lead up to 9-11. November 6, 99, they simulated uh, a hijacked jet flying out of JFK with the intention of crashing into the United Nations building. June 5, 2000, they simulated two hijackings, one in which they intended to fly the plane into the Statue of Liberty, the other White House. On October 16, 2000, NORAD saw a uh, drill, saw a hijacker once again targeting the U- UN building, and another nearly identical exercise on October 23rd of that year did as well. Uh, they, they, they had Amalgam Virgo, um, Operation Amalgam Virgo, which was uh, a, a, about Osama bin Laden uh, hijacking uh, del- uh, uh, a passenger jet. Right. But in June 2002, the, the Amalgam Virgo 02 version of that drill, which was in the planning stages on 9-11, it involved a simulated hijacking of a real Delta Airlines 757, which is something else that comes in to play in that war- 9-11 war game story. All of the simulated hijackings that were taking place on the day of 9-11 as the real hijack, real quote-unquote hijackings, whatever they were, mm-hmm. were taking place. Again, this has to raise alarm bells, and that's why someone like Bush would feel compelled to lie about it. Um, again, at the normiest perspective, it's because, well, I mean, they can't say that they weren't prepared for this sort of situation or they, you know, they're, they're covering up incompetence would be the the way out of that. Um, but I think if we're to really face the cognitive dissonance that this type of pattern of events shows us, I, I think we have to realize, oh, there were people involved in the highest echelons of government planning for the types of war game scenarios and drills that uh, very much had this exact scenario on their mind. Mm. Well, let me let me flip off the switch on probably the most active part of my brain for a second and attempt to play devil's advocate on Bush lying and why he needed to do it. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I qualify this before I say it. Do not take this out of context and tell me that this is what I think because it's not. Thank you. Anyway, James, I, I, you know I wasn't speaking to you. <laughs> But I, I have to do that before I say something of like course. what I'm about I, I to know. say. <laughs> I, I do this for a living, too. I get all sorts of feedback like that. Too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, just save your emails, please. All right. Anyway, um, you, you just send, send, you send me other hate mail, just something else, not this. All right, here it is. Um, <clears throat> given that we know that there is a, a, a constant industry within the government which comes up with contingency plans and develops these drills based on those contingency plans and actually attempts to plan for all scenarios that is that is factual you can you can quote me on that part but the next part here we go <laughs> Given that that is the circumstance, uh, could one not say that why would he reveal that they did know this? Because, after all, they should have a contingency plan for just about everything. They do have the uh, imagined contingencies for things like attacking Canada, if need be. They do have the imagined contingency plans for if New Jersey secedes from the states and how they would take it back. Uh, all of these scenarios are thought out constantly, strategically. Um, so to state this uh, and and to uh, do anything other than lie might be to reveal uh, something that would be much more frightening to an already frightened public, James. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I see what you're saying there. And uh, I could even up you on that. Hell, I mean, cool. FEMA has actually drilled for a zombie apocalypse. Look it up. They actually did have yes, a did. zombie preparedness drill. Um, so there you go. This this stuff happens all the time, as you say, and they're preparing for every contingency. OK, fair enough. But then the question, again, why he felt compelled to lie about it, specifically when the documents uh, exist and presumably I, I think he had to know we're coming out based on this that would prove it to be a lie. Why in that moment did he have to try to defend it? I mean, I suppose there is there is the genuine 
ignorance. Maybe he was just too stupid to, to know that these things had happened. Maybe he's just that far detached from Forgot. <laughs> uh, real commander in chief. Um, the other, the, but the other side of this, I think the other real defense of this from the normie perspective is it's cover up of incompetence. Okay. So they drilled for it. They thought about it. They war gamed it out. They planned it not just once or twice, but literally several times that we can identify from it just in a couple of years leading up to this. Mm-hmm. And yet they still monumentally failed. Uh, in their response that morning. So uh, they're, they're covering up incompetence. And I think that would be the out. And, and uh, that's always going to be the emergency escape hatch if anything starts to come out with regards to 9-11. They're going to say, oh, okay, yes, there's a big, long cover-up, and they, the, the government lied. And uh, it, as we know, the 9-11 Commission even thought of, uh, about referring some of their um, the testimony to prosecutors to prosecute people in the Pentagon who they knew lied to them. Um, they decided against doing that because of the national security concerns. But um, they did consider doing that because they did, the Pentagon outright lied to the 9-11 Commission. Yeah. So we know that these lies have gone on, cover-up has gone on, but it's just to cover up incompetence. And that's that's always going to be the escape hatch. And there's really not much that we from the outside without access to those documents or subpoena power to get people to testify on the record under oath, well, there's not much that we can do to say – to, to counteract that, because how are we going to know? I think the real point is to actually have some sort of real investigation with actual teeth. Um, without that, we will never be able to sort out what was, you know, cover up of incompetence versus what was active complicity in what was happening. No, I absolutely agree with you. But it's just it's remarkable to me, though, to uh, to witness the contortions that people will go through to uh to avoid the reality you know again i recognize that there are constant drills there are constant uh, events being planned for whether they be you know the the next mass shooting in an area or they be the zombie apocalypse i mean it, it goes across the board across the spectrum right you know you, you you can't find a flavor in that ice cream shop that somebody hasn't heard of before i get it but it, it's just very very odd when you see very specific elements being planned right before something actually happens that they claim fits that precise scenario almost to a T. You know, you, you have a plane crashing into the White House. That didn't happen on 9-11, but planes crashing into buildings, that did happen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just And uh, I think one way to break people's conditioning on issues like these, because yeah. it is a type of conditioning that prevents people from taking that extra step, one way is to to try to, at the extent possible, detach yourself from the situation and become an, uh, a private, private investigator or a detective that's trying to solve a mystery of some sort and look at it from that perspective. If this was just some sort of crime that had taken place and the police were investigating and they were honest and upright police, what kinds of things would they consider and what would, what would be relevant? And if you had, for example, this suspect in a crime who you know had planned and actually even simulated the crime several times before the crime took place, that would at least be on your radar um, in terms of, you know, when you put on your detective hat. That would be something you would be looking at. And sure, that means that he could be being set up by someone else to take the blame or something like that. You know, you'd have to investigate, but it would at least be something that would be worthy of investigation. It would not be something you'd simply dismiss because of coincidence. Well, right. And then you need what? You know, the three standards, right? Means, motive, and opportunity. So, look, means they, they have. Uh, now, motive, all right, let's put it aside for a minute because that's usually the most difficult thing to deal with opportunity well is there an opportunity to do this that has to do with proximity usually in a lot of crimes like did they have access to the crime scene at the time the crime was committed did they have access to or the ability to obtain the uh, instruments by which the crime was committed uh this sort of logic if you break it down to that uh, you know, it does go into a whole other direction. Right. And, and actually, yeah. it is interesting because uh, I have had this feedback from time to time from people who take the uh, – again, I hope people would look at 9-11 war games if they haven't. I think it's a pretty comprehensive – well, no, I won't even say comprehensive. There's a lot more information out there about the war games and what have you. But in terms of one-hour documentary, I think it does a pretty good job. But um, it, there are people who take that information and say, well, then couldn't it be possible that – Al-Qaeda knew about these uh, drills that were going to be taking place and decided to go on 9-11 because they knew that it would be confusing or something like that. And, I mean, I guess that's the kind of mental backflip you've got to do once you start to realize that there is some sort of connection here. Well, then maybe Al-Qaeda had infiltrated. And although that does sound kind of – I mean, at first – 
at first glance, your idea is to roll your eyes at it. But that actually was um, that was said by I believe there were agents in one of the FBI field offices. I believe the one that was looking at the uh, th- that was filing the reports about the, the the Muslims that were learning to fly but not land. Um, and they said uh, I, it was something like that in that context where there were some FBI agents who said it's it's like Al Qaeda has penetrated the top levels of the government. I mean that was a quote from one of the uh, the officials that was involved in the investigation because of just how how eerily they seemed to know what was going on and what how to best to take advantage of this and and to stifle investigations of you know Musawi and people like that before before 9-11 took place. Um, so they, this is something that's actually kind of, in some sense, been floated even by people involved in the investigation. I, I think that's kind of, you know, that's the least likely, in my opinion. Oh, do you think Al-Qaeda penetrated the upper ranks of NORAD, or do you think NORAD might have had something more to do with it? Uh, I, I think one of those is more likely. But at any rate, that's where you get into when you start realizing the, the importance of these, these types of m- maneuvers. Right. And look, I appreciate your perspective on 9-11. I don't think you and I have ever actually discussed 9-11 uh, together. So th- this has been uh, a really, uh, really a thrill for me. I'm glad that uh, we got to it because never have before. You know, you know, what comes to mind, though, is also another recent event. Uh, and, and I know it's a bit of a public spectacle and you want to talk about mugging for the camera and all that. But I'm sure you even saw over there and definitely took into your wheelhouse at least a notice of uh, the the 9/11 first responders uh, controversy, and uh, you know our our friend Mr. Uh, former Daily Show host, uh, <laughs> you know going going to uh, going to talk directly to the Congress people and the gentleman who uh, died shortly thereafter, you know about the uh, the the victims fund and why it is and all this. I mean, what what did you think of that? Because it got a very strange treatment here in the U.S. because there is the iconography in this country, and I I don't know if if this is a worldwide sort of uh, way that people look at their military, but here we have this almost again religiosity connected to the military, and has now been extended to the first responders and is also supposed to be forgiving of the militarized police and all of this kind of stuff over here, this uh, this culture of hero worship, uh, uh, which, you know, in, in some cases I understand it, but in other cases I do not, and I do not understand the religiosity of it. Uh, but I understand how, you know, look, people who do good deeds should be lauded for it. Um and the people that went into the the ground zero area on 9-11, regardless of what you think happened that day, one thing is for certain that air was toxic and it definitely damaged a lot of people who went in there to do nothing but dig out their, their, their fallen comrades in some ways and in other ways just to save whoever they could based on a disaster that was emergent. Um, you know, and John Stewart, impassioned pleas, all of those things that made it to the news, um, you know, it, it's it, it kind of gave me a real mixed feeling about how um, how this has been handled and how people are still handling the post 9-11 reality. Um, did you have any any commentary about that recent, uh, not real super recent, but I haven't talked to you in a while, so uh, it's sort of recent uh, phenomena that went through the media as well? Yes, I uh, I do. And uh, for people who are interested in that, we did cover it on New World Next Week um, with James Evan Pilato about three weeks ago or so. So people can dig through the archives for that. Mm-hmm. Um, to, uh, uh, but on the broader issue, I think this is one that should not be politicized in any way, shape or form, because it is the one thing that I think we can all agree, whether we are 9-11 truthers or not, or some variation or variant in between. At any rate, I think everyone can agree that the people who rushed into the smoldering ruins that day, risking their lives, trying to do what they could, really are heroes and really do deserve to be taken care of um, for their bravery for that day. And That's the fact right. that they are dying from that, literally dying from that, I think everyone can appreciate that. So um, this is an issue that should not be politicized in any way, shape or form. Um, but it is also extremely uncomfortable for the government because any 
anything beyond the most the surface level scrutiny of this will start to uncover the misdeeds of Christine Todd Whitman and the EPA and their deliberate lying to the American public and specifically to the people who were rushing into ground zero in the days and weeks after 9-11, lying to them about the health risks that they knew 100 percent on the record knew were there. And uh, for people who don't know about that, I did a, uh, an episode of 9-11 Suspects uh, a few years ago where I was talking about different people that were uh, that should be suspects in any real investigation of 9-11. One of them, Christine Todd Whitman. And in that, I go through and document what the EPA knew and when they knew it and the fact that they knew they were lying to people who were the, the first responders there and uh, and that people are literally dying from that even as we speak and over the past dec- decade and a half many people have died um and that that's an important and uncomfortable story and i think that's why there's this kind of yes you're right there's there's generally sort of a hero worship of the the blue line and the police and all of this but 911 it is kind of a touchy thing they don't want to go too far with that because eventually you're going to be bumping up against the fact that it was there was a deliberate and and knowing and we can prove it government cover up um, that has led to people dying from 9-11. Whether you're a 9-11 truther or not, that is just a documentable fact. And that has to do with the EPA and Christine Todd Whitman. So I hope people who aren't familiar with that will take a look at it. Because I think that that might be the softest spot to attack when you're trying to lead the discussion of 9-11. Because as I say, I don't think anyone's going to say, oh, you know, screw those police and firefighters that rushed into ground zero, you know. No one thinks that. No. So why don't they, why are they being swept under the rug? And and why are they not being taken care of better that John Stewart has to go up to Capitol Hill and plead for them? Uh, yeah, you know, although it should be pointed out that that was grandstanding and mugging for the camera because um, in that House Judiciary Committee that he was attending, he was slamming them. Why are so few people here today and all of this? It was explained to him before he started mugging for the camera that there were, I think, 15 people on that committee and two of them ha- were out that day on other business. But, you know, we're here and we're listening and that kind of thing. He, he was making it sound like, you know, there should have been 300 people in that room or something. He knew that that was not true. Uh, it worked. It got a lot of attention. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's I guess that's what he, he got paid to do for many years is get attention. Well, and see, there's the thing where I, I kind of see the superficiality of it, but at the same time recognize that it uh, may be absolutely necessary to do. Well, there because, you go. That's the issue. You know, positive propaganda. So there, Can there's you use propaganda for good. So there's some is positive propaganda, soon? right? <laughs> See, that that's that's how I wrap that one around. Uh, you know, and and look, uh, that th- this is one thing that should be universal. And uh, again, you were like, you know, nine eleven truther or not, or somewhere in between. Here's something that should be understood about that in general. Um, which is the title of John Gold's book, who's been a guest on this show. I don't know if you're familiar with John Gold. I'm sure you are. Uh, but we were lied to about 9-11. This is an undisputable statement. Um, and why do I say that? Because even if you believe the entire government narrative over the hijackings and everything else, uh, one thing that is absolutely true is exactly what James just told you about. Regarding Christy Todd Whitman, who was the former governor of New Jersey, who was the head of the EPA at the time, you know, who allowed people to think and was in charge of the agency that allowed people to think that uh, the, the health risks were not severe enough to warrant other precautions or to maybe consider whether you want to risk your life to go into this area. And an uninformed hero... Okay, going into an area like that, because as James just said, also, this would be another thing hard for you to argue against, uh, is, is still somebody that did not deserve that. And, uh, there, there you go. If you can't agree that anything else you were lied to regarding that circumstance, the issue, what happened, the fact that the steel was dragged away, however the buildings came down, um, problem. You were, you were lied to about it. The people of that part of Manhattan were lied to about it. The people going in there to save other individuals, to recover bodies even later on were lied to. Period. And when you talk about what Bush said, well, th- there's another lie. And what did they do? Compound that further. But, hey, pay no attention to that because here's the anthrax attacks. And now we've gone full circle with the discussion, haven't we? Indeed. Um, well, it is a rich tapestry, and different pieces keep weaving back together 
Um, sometimes in unexpected ways, sometimes in ways I don't even recognize. And it's pointed out to me, I just did a recent video on Silicon Valley and the history of how that's tied in with uh, military and intelligence agencies. And someone pointed out in the comment section of that episode, oh, someone in this episode is mentioned who was also mentioned in a conversation that James did four years ago. And here's the link. And I... I, I was racking my brain thinking, I don't remember that. And I went back and listened to it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot William Shockley was related to the Georgia Guidestones. What a strange, what a strange way for that to all tie in. But then mm-hmm. it kind of makes sense because I, as I was pointing out, all these Silicon Valley guys were related to eugenics. And eugenics ties in with the how and why Big Oil conquered the world documentaries that I did. And, and it's all it all weaves back together when you really start looking at the big picture. But it's the kind of thing you keep mining these different veins for years and years and years and you keep finding these different characters that are related in bizarre ways and the the story just keeps growing but in a sense it's almost just the same threads that you're unraveling of of one big tapestry Mm, it's like the family tree that the longer you investigate it the more the branches come out the more wider the net is for who it is you might be related to uh you know if if you're just looking at your own personal genealogy and that's yet another subject but we're not going to get there because we've only got a few minutes left and uh you know i i wonder what it is that is on your mind just in general that uh, you think of as something that is not being covered that needs to be covered by individuals doing independent media uh, you know is, is there is there something that is lacking out there at the moment uh, in your judgment I know this is like a you know putting you on the spot in a personal yeah. kind of <laughs> corner there but but I, but I like doing that just a little bit to you James you know uh, just a little like ah, let me poke at you with the stick for a second what are we missing right now you think that that people People should be paying attention to. Well, let me preface this by saying this is the unanswerable question because there's a, a million different things that people can or should be looking into. And, you know, I mean, it's a judgment call and I'm not going to disparage other people for having different opinions or different ideas. So I, I just want people to look into whatever they're looking into and spread that information. I think that's what's important. But myself personally, uh, one issue that I tangentially touched on recently in one of my Propaganda Watch episodes that I think is worth delving into in much more detail is about intellectual property, uh, which is a concept that for a lot of people they give a little bit of thought to and they think, well, there may be something wrong with our current copyright and patent laws and things, and yeah, we might need to fine-tune them, but you know, that generally speaking, the concept is valid. Um, I myself several years ago started actually looking into it. I didn't really have a strong opinion one way, way or another, but I was quite thoroughly convinced uh, that intellectual property is invalid and is in fact a monumental, monumental deficit to humanity. And the, uh, just from an economic perspective, the trillions of dollars of drag on the economy that it has brought to the United States alone, let alone all of the signatories to the Berne Convention is, I mean, incredible. But then when you think of all the the creative work and energy that has been lost to humanity because of intellectual property and the types of draconian laws that are brought in on the back of it. That's that's another thing entirely. But I think it is an important issue to, A, expose. I mean, just because it is something, once you look into it and you really look at the roots of it, you realize how fraudulent it is. But secondarily, because that is one of the attack vectors through which they're clamping down on uh, free expression on the Internet. And we're starting to see, well, we've started to see that, of course, on places like YouTube and others where, you know, I mean, I've had things taken down for ridiculous reasons um, related to copyright that weren't infringement, but there's no proper appeal and all of that. I mean, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But now it's even getting further codified into law with the EU passing their new draconian legislation that's going to, if it gets enacted and if depending how it gets uh, legislated, is going to require... Uh, YouTube and all the other platforms to require pre-upload filters that essentially, as we talked about in our previous conversation, talking about internet censorship and social media and that, um, is going to completely weed out uh, the ability for any type of startup or any type of alternative to these major uh, social media platforms to ever come up. And this is all being done under the guise of copyright and and patent protection and things like this it's always under those guises it's acta and sopa and pippa and all the other legislation they've tried like ramrods over the last several years to use Mm -hmm. to basically clamp down on the internet and it's it's coming and uh, i think we have to address it at the root that no this isn't just uh we need to tweak these laws a little bit it's that these laws themselves are inherently unjust and cannot be used for good 
you know, and, and you're very, uh, concise and intelligent explanation. I'd like to boil it down to the street level very quickly. As somebody who is a musician, uh, and experienced firsthand what happens, uh, based on the corporatization of intellectual properties, okay, and how they are handled and how the, uh, uh, the, the individuals who are allowed to steer those particular entities around the, the game board, uh, go. All right. Here, here's the thing. Um, it's it's just fine to think that you know an artist should own what it is they created. I get it, but the problem is that the way these things are structured, eventually, it seems as though look, you can't make music because I own music. I mean, you think that's a joke, but YouTube has literally censored videos for playing for uh, gu- guitar teaching videos for playing a D sus two chord. Right, and the claim was that that chord was copyrighted because it was detected in some song or other. The person appealed that claim, and thankfully won. Probably because they have over a million subscribers and have a very large fan base to to raise a ruckus with. But that's crazy but that is the road that we head down with this yeah well you can you yeah of course you should own your idea well what does that mean exactly can you own a chord no no you cannot and in fact you cannot own ideas you own things that you then use to instantiate those ideas right. and if your idea of justice is that because you came up with some chord progression that i can't use my fingers on my own guitar to make that same chord progression then i'm think i think we have a fundamentally different conception of what these issues are really about and that's something i'm definitely going to elaborate on more because i realize it does jar people at first when they first hear it but when it is explained out it is philosophically undefendable ultimately to right. say that you have an actual property right in ideas and intangibles it becomes a self-defeating proposition yeah and, and you're right of course the way this always plays out in reality is that this isn't about property rights and philosophical arguments this is about intellectual monopoly and the point of any monopoly is for those politically connected individuals who can get wield the, the monopoly stick to use it as a stick to beat off their competition that's all it ever is and it only ever serves to benefit the large corporate interests in the politically connected and that, that i mean that's there's so much evidence of that throughout history that is completely undeniable uh one quick example i'll give just because i think it's particularly ridiculous and funny um i have a yearly series every year uh, i put out a summer truth music uh video where i just highlight some different music that d- different artists are doing uh, about truth related issues spreading awareness so i always try to highlight that type of stuff mm-hmm. um and so i do a video where i just play sometimes entire songs sometimes just segments of songs i've been doing this for years the other about a month ago i got a message from youtube uh your 2015 summer truth music video has been flagged for copyright violation and i I look at it and it's a song that was specifically sent to me by an artist saying can you put this in your truth music video and so uh i I said sure and so they sent me the mp3 file that i then played a a little section of i don't think it was even the full song on my video Mm -hmm. four years later i get this notice from youtube who is violated copyright i'm like that's odd why why now like why how did this suddenly come up i get it and then i get it separately i get a message from that artist who sent me that song saying oh we just released our new album we put it up on cd baby so you can you can you let your audience know Oh, I get it. No, this artist had nothing whatsoever to do with flagging this for copyright. CD it was Baby when did they it. upload it to CD Baby. CD Baby claims it is their their material, and then they put it into the YouTube algorithm that then goes and searches it out and flags it. I appeal that and say I have explicit written consent, and in fact, pleading from the artist to put this in their video, rejected. Yeah. Because who is the one who actually looks at that claim? It isn't even YouTube. It's the person who makes the claim. Well, so, of course, CD Baby's going to say, oh, it's too bad. And it gets so further. So that's it, and there it stands. So now that, that video has been monetized by them. It's got ads on it right. that aren't mine and that go to the CD Baby because they own that music. Now, it's never about protecting the individual, let alone person. It's about corporate-connected political interests. No, and here's the horrible thing about that, James. You ready? It, it, it gets worse because simply because the artist owns the copyright doesn't mean they own the publishing see the publishing is not the copyright and there are various layers <laughs> to this that can cause this to keep happening i had the same thing happen with payday monsanto by the way uh where, where payday gave me the stuff asked me to put it in, into into my show 
and use it uh, as, you know, you know, you want to use it as a bumper, use it as a bumper, man. You know, and, and I tried and I had exactly this problem with CD Baby. That's one thing. The second thing is you want to hear real ridiculous. One time a microphone noise from my show was flagged for copyright. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not kidding. Birds have been bird noises chirping has been flagged for copyright before things like that. Yeah, know? yeah, but yeah. I mean a, a a microphone a piece of feedback that occurred because I had something unbalanced between the uh the uh the uh, analog and the digital, you know, uh, a little bit of feedback. Apparently there's a song and I don't even remember the artist or anything, but apparently there's a song that uses a similar sounding feedback loop <laughs> that mm. I was flagged for copyright on that. And I went, you got to be kidding me. But uh, th- th- this is this is the reality of it, and it gets worse because even with the artist's consent, they can return back to you and tell you it's still not valid because they don't own the publishing. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. When you upload it to CD Baby, you don't get to decide anymore. Nope. And that's that's a, a apparent. But even so, even if it were, even if it was it wasn't like that, I mean, the the appeal goes directly to CD Baby, so they get to say yes or no. Yeah. And then if you wanted to escalate from there, I right, well, okay, let's file a lawsuit and get the lawyers involved. I mean, I mean, how many people are going to do that? So it's a win win for the politically connected corporate interests. Exactly. And that's the problem with a lot of things. Anyway, James. <laughs> I love you, man. I really do. I love your website, CorbettReport.com. Obviously, go there. I, I do not, and, and by the way, even though James said he's on YouTube, if you want to go there and look at his stuff, great. But I don't really advise it um, <laughs> because he's on BitChute and a whole bunch of other places. And, hey, you can get to everything from CorbettReport.com, uh, you know, access to years and years. Do you have your entire archive up on the site still or – uh, pretty much. I think I started posting the videos to my site on, in 2011. So I think the first couple of years aren't backed up there. I guess I should get around to doing that. But, uh, but yeah, pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, is up there. Everything you're going to need anyways up on CorporateReport.com. There you go. And and loads and loads of great documentaries. How Big Oil Conquered the World, uh, the, the Century of Enslavement on the Federal Reserve. I mean, it is just endless. Even the short stuff. Uh, uh, the, I, I, by the way, I absolutely love those Meet This Character and Meet That Character. One of the best ones was Meet Lee Harvey Oswald, <laughs> um, which I uh, wonder why it is Chuck like that one. Anyway, uh, interesting piece on there. Which was taken down but from youtube by the way uh, they took that down (laughs) yeah it's on bit shoot it's on my site don't worry but they took it off youtube see there you go but look you can go and get uh, a hold of all this stuff by going to corbettreport.com and again james corbett who is a singular force in what i call independent media because i don't like the word alternative anymore i gotta tell you uh james corbett thanks for joining me man thank you very much for having me and meanwhile, guys, look, the Ocelli Effect is done for tonight. So no matter who you are, where you are, I hope you're well. And, you know, after all, remember, I'm near the Ocelli. All of you are actually the effect. Good night. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes the Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com support.